Welcome to the Makeup Lab for Freezing Point of Solutions. Before we begin, you're going to need a printed copy of the new version of the lab Freezing Point of Solutions. The one in your lab manual has been updated. The new version can be found by clicking the link in the description. So what we're going to do is talk a little bit about the theory involved in this lab. We'll go over the procedures that you would have done. You'll be provided with some sample data and you will complete the lab calculations and the post lab. So to start off, we need to talk about the relationship between phase change and energy because this lab is on freezing point. It's important to understand the way the particles are different in the three states of matter. In a solid, they're held very rigidly in place. They can't move past each other. In a liquid, they are still sticking to each other. There's still an attraction there, but they can now slide past each other. They have more of a freedom of movement. In the gas state, the particles are totally separate from each other. Those intermolecular forces have been totally overcome. The particles are moving in three, in three dimensional direction and they're hitting the container uh, and they're hitting each other. So there is one aspect of energy that we need to consider that's different between these three. The first is the attraction between the particles. This is called enthalpy and it's symbolized with delta H. This is observed in the form of heat and heat can either be absorbed or released as you go between these three states of matter. The other factor we need to consider is how spread out, how dispersed or clumped together that the energy is between the states of matter. This value is known as entropy and we symbolize it with delta S. As you change between the states of matter, these different values are going to change in a, in a predicted direction. As you go between a solid and a liquid, you have to put enthalpy in in order to overcome these intermolecular forces. And as a result, that energy in the liquid form is more dispersed. So what happens when you go from a solid to a liquid, also called melting, is that both of these values are going to increase. By the same token, when you go from a liquid to a gas, heat has to go in, and also the energy is more dispersed, so this is all, these values are also going to increase. What happens when you go in the other direction is there's the same magnitude, but it's the opposite sign. So when you go from a gas to a liquid, also known as condensation, um, the heat needs to come out of the state, and also as a result, that energy is less dispersed around. So these values are going to be the same magnitude as going from a liquid to a gas, but opposite in sign. Okay, and a similar thing will happen when you go from a liquid to a solid. Now there's an equation that relates these two properties, enthalpy change and entropy change, to the temperature at which a phase change happens. So for today, we're going to be talking about freezing point. So we can specify it by putting T with a little F down below. And then there are certain values that are associated with freezing. Freezing is also known as solidification. So we can talk about the enthalpy change of SOL standing for solidification and entropy change of solidification. What's important to know about this equation is to see that you have a number on a numerator and a denominator. And if they change in a certain way, it's gonna have a predictable effect upon the temperature of the phase change. So by that, I mean that enthalpy change is on the numerator. So if this goes up, if this value goes up, the temperature will also go up. These two are directly proportional. On the denominator, we have change in entropy. If this value increases because it's on the denominator, that's going to cause the freezing temperature to go, go down, the temperature at which the phase change happens to go down. One of the things that we were going to do in lab today is to make a solution and see how that affects the freezing point of, of the solvent. So just to define the new unit that we're going to need for uh, the solution. In this diagram, the white squares are representing the solute particles, and then the red circles are representing the solvent particles. So the solute is getting dissolved, the solvent is doing the dissolving. The ratio between the amounts of these, in general, is a term that we call concentration. Because these units can vary in how you want to measure them, we can have different units of concentration. So one of them is percent by mass, another is parts per million, and then a third one that you use last semester was molarity. 
Now the unit we need today needs to indicate the relative number of particles that are in the solution. So here in these two beakers is two salts, sodium chloride and sodium iodide, and they're in this equal amounts. Now even though the masses are equal, that doesn't necessarily mean that the number of particles is equal. In fact, they are different. In the sodium chloride beaker, there are going to be more particles floating around than in the sodium iodide because sodium iodide has a higher molar mass. So what we need in our unit for concentration is a unit that indicates the relative number of particles that are present. So on our numerator for the amount of solute, it's going to be moles of solute. On the bottom, we need a, a value that is not going to change as temperature changes. So one unit that doesn't change as temperature changes is mass. So we're going to have the mass of the solvent on the denominator. And rather than grams, we're going to use kilograms because that tends to give us numbers that are easier to work with. This ratio is known as molality, not to be confused with molarity. We symbolize it with a lowercase m. That's the unit for molality, and it stands for moles per kilogram. So it's, it's important to know how to interpret uh, a number of molality, what it means. So let's say we have a 0.3, what we would call molal solution of NaCl in water. What does that mean? What that means is for every kilogram of water that we have, we're going to have a portion of a mole. So if this represents one mole, we're going to have 0.3 moles, 3 tenths of a mole. So every mole, every kilogram of water, there's going to be contained 0.3 moles of NaCl. That's what that number means. So what the lab is going to look at is the freezing point and how the freezing point gets affected when you dissolve a solute in it. So what we're going to look at is how the solute changes the properties of the solvent. The name for this is a colligative property. It's any property that gets messed up or changed when you dissolve something in it. The one you're going to look at today is freezing point. There are other colligative properties, though, that won't be looked at today, but it's good to know that there are others. Uh, another colligative property is boiling point, and then a third one is osmotic pressure, and this is important for uh, living cells. So for the lab today, there, the goals are going to be to measure the freezing point of a substance. The substance is going to be cyclohexane, and then we're going to dissolve something in the cyclohexane and make a solution out of it and see how that affects the freezing point. You will be provided with data to work with. Another goal that we're going to address is how does the solute affect the freezing point? By that I mean, does the solute make the freezing point of the cyclohexane go up or go down? And then, how is the concentration related to the freezing point? Does making the solution more concentrated affect the freezing point more or less? So for part A and B, here's what you would have done. We would have taken a test tube and put some cyclohexane in it, put a vernier thermometer in there, and then added a wire to stir it. This would be set up and lowered into an ice bath as shown in this picture. So we put it in the ice bath, and then we measure the temperature as the cyclohexane freezes by the LabQuest. The LabQuest is going to produce a graph that looks something like that. The way we get the freezing point is we find the average of, of the point at which the graph flattens out. So the average of these is known as the mean, and in this trial, the, the mean is 6.6 .6 degrees Celsius. So that's going to be the value we are going to use in our data. So on page 7 is where the data begins. Where it says freezing point of pure cyclohexane, up at the top you can put 6.6 .6 degrees Celsius. The next part, C and D, what you would have done was taken the same cyclohexane but dissolved something in it. The solute is going to be called naphthalene. So let's get some information down about naphthalene. Name, naphthalene. Assign mass. This would be a, the mass that you would have been told to weigh out into the test tube. So let's say that it's 0 0.30 grams. The molar mass of naphthalene, given its formula, is 128.17. So these are numbers that we're going to need in order to calculate the molality. So we're going to weigh out the amounts. So let's say that the beaker uh, and a test tube are going to weigh 50.08 grams. And then when you pour cyclohexane in there, the total mass goes up to 61.75 grams. And then to that same test tube and cyclohexane and beaker, you add 0.3 grams of 
not filling. So now the total mass is 62.05. So record these numbers down. Uh, you may need to pause the video if needed. After that, you can calculate the mass of cyclohexane and the mass of the assigned solute, the mass of, of naphthalene, by simple subtraction. After that, you're going to need to calculate the molality of the solution. So the next, several, next slide is going to show you how to perform a sample calculation of molality. So if you need assistance with that, uh, the, this next description will run through a sample calculation. So let's say we want to calculate the molality of a solution that contains 2.92 grams of NaCl in 100 grams of water. Another number that we're going to need to use is the molar mass of NaCl, and that's 58.4 grams per mole. If we want to determine the molality, we need to know two numbers in this fraction, the moles of NaCl and the kilograms of water. So let's start off with the moles of NaCl. The two values we're going to need to use is the mass of NaCl and the molar mass of NaCl. So we start with the mass and we're going to use the molar mass as a conversion factor. And what we get here is 0 .500, point, I'm sorry, 0 0.0500 moles of NaCl. That becomes our numerator. Now for the denominator, kilograms of water. What we need to do is to turn this mass, 100 grams, into kilograms. So 100 grams, 1 kilogram over 1,000 grams gives us 0.1 kilograms. That becomes the denominator. The last step is to divide the numbers. So 0 0.05 divided by 0 0.1 is 0 0.500 moles of NaCl per kilogram of water. 0.5 moles per kilogram, or to abbreviate that, we just simply write a lowercase cursive m, standing for molality. So that is the molality of the solution. After you calculate the molality of your solution using the numbers you were provided, now we're going to talk about how we would freeze the solution and what the freezing points are so you'll be given some measured values. So what we then do is take that solution and put it into the ice bath just like before and record the temperature over time. From that we can get the freezing point. So let's say trial 1 freezing point was 2.3, trial 2 was 2.5. We don't do a trial 3. So what you can do is calculate the average freezing point and the calculated change in the freezing point. Because remember, we measured the freezing point of the cyclohexane before and found it to be 6.6 .6 degrees. So the way you get the calculated change in freezing point is you take the freezing point of the pure cyclohexane, which again was 6.6 .6 degrees, and you subtract it from the average freezing point of the solution that you'll find in the box above. So you need to calculate that. This box in the middle here, we don't need. What we would have done in lab is uh, collected our data, compiled it, and put it onto a spreadsheet in order to create two graphs. So that's what we're going to look at next. I'm going to show you a spreadsheet that contains some sample data, uh, and from that you can just transcribe these graphs onto this part of the, the lab handout. So for solute 1, you can write naphthalene right there, and solute 2, the other solute that we would have looked at is called dichlorobenzene. So here's a screenshot of the um, spreadsheet of some sample data that shows how the concentration changes and how that affects the change in the freezing point. The blue section is for the first solute, naphthalene, and the second one is for dichlorobenzene. In the description, you should see a link to this spreadsheet if you would like to take a look at it yourself. But what you need to do is to take these two graphs here and transcribe them onto the page we just looked at previously. As for the rest of the lab handout, there are three more pages, um, 9, 10, and 11, and this, this is the post lab. So this coupled with the data is going to be pages CPS 7 through 11, and these will be due at the beginning of your la next lab session. If you have any questions, please contact your lab instructor.